Hey, today is November 6th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast. We're on episode 65. Today on Human Factors Cast, we are talking about bringing your keyboard into virtual reality, testing out those bionic eyes, and making ethical AI chatbots. Play that video game music. Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. And I could, of course, I couldn't do this alone. They don't call him Mr. B.A. for nothing. It's Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. <laughs> What's up, Nick? It is so good to be here on a nice, beautiful Monday night. How are you, my man? Hey, there he is. I'm good, buddy. How are you? Oh, I am loving life, sir. Loving life. Loving life. What's going on in life? Oh, honestly, man, this is a kind of a hectic week, and it's only Monday. So this week, I've actually got the World Usability Day event in L.A. through the uh, user experience group that I work for, so UXPALA. So it's just been chaos, kind of like speakers canceling at the last second, trying to find people to fill the spots. But it's been nuts, just running up and down. But so our listeners know, I don't even know if I have this in the events tab of our Slack, but I'll make sure to get in there tonight. The World Usability Day in LA is coming up on Thursday night. So if you are in town, please come out and I'd love to say hi and talk to you all that kind of good stuff. Yes, yes. And if any of our listeners do have any events, they could be local, national, international. I don't care. Whatever it is, we are trying to facilitate a place where... You guys can come and sort of hang out with us and let everybody know what's going on in the field and uh, all these interesting events that people are going to. Of course, Blake and I here are Southern California, so we tend to have an eye towards the things that are going on around here. But uh, it is a place where you can share anything, and hopefully someone will find something nearby. I know we've already been spreading information. Um, One of our Slack listeners actually didn't even know there was a chapter in Germany and... and, uh, you know, our bonus episodes of HFES this year kind of were a recommendation for a, a glowing recommendation for him to go. So, uh, you know, you'll find out all sorts of things in the Human Factor Slack. So uh, come join us. <laughs> yeah, most definitely, man. I love t- I don't know. I love talking to people in our Slack. It seems like I, every week I meet somebody new and we just have something else to banter about. Yeah, there's been some really good conversation in there. Um, people have been asking about uh, sort of, you know, what are the next steps in their in their uh in their career, looking into breaking into the field of UX. And we actually have a couple of listeners who are volunteering to uh, potentially help us out with um, some subject matter if we are not well, well enough versed in it. So there's that too. And, and it's just a great community. And uh, welcome all of you guys to check it out. It, our, our link is in the show notes on our website. Pretty much anywhere you can find us, you can find that link as well. Um, but I just want to give a quick shout out to Quinn D joined this week. So if you join our Slack, we will shout you out on the show. And, uh, if that's not reason enough, I don't know what is. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And thanks again, Quinn D for writing us back. It was good to hear from you again. And I hope some of our advice about career path was helpful and I can't wait to see the things you do. So Blake last week on the show, I, uh, I mentioned that, uh, I got, I got bit by a dog right before the show started. Yes, I remember seeing that in the Slack no- or the notes this morning when I was redoing them. Yes, how's your bite? So this is the segment all of the show called Bite Watch. <laughs> the Baywatch theme is playing. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, the bite's doing well. I'm, I'm recovering. And mainly this was just an excuse to play the Baywatch theme. Uh, uh, kick back to the 90s. So uh, hope you enjoyed that. All right, anyway, <laughs> no, the bite's doing well. Uh, I got to talk about something serious for a minute, though. Uh, Animoji. You know what this is? Yes, I saw this on Twitter today. <laughs> so, so my partner got the iPhone X uh, this this weekend. Uh, she's one of the lucky ones, and uh, she, so I was testing out this Animoji feature. And I, I gotta say, man, the facial recognition is pretty good, and it's it's really something else to kind of see your face projected on this avatar that is an emoji. Uh, like, so um, tried a couple examples. One was a one was the poop emoji because why not? And then one was like a chicken and then there was a bear or something. I, but like I, I was just kind of blown away by the facial recognition of the Animoji. Yeah. So actually what I saw on Twitter, I didn't see the um, 
the outcome of it, but I saw how they actually were doing it in kind of that, you know, unintrusive way where it just like hits you with the infrared sensors all over your face and they use like a infrared sensing camera to show you like actually how it's hitting your face and where it's coming from on the camera which allows it to really get those nooks and crannies of your face and be so good as far as facial recognition but it's a it's an interesting application for the iphone that's for sure now at least for me um this has some interesting applications for if you're like uh, whoa my god my thing is going off. It's crazy. All right. Yeah, get out of here. Stupid soundboard. All right. Anyway, if this has some applications for, oh, my goodness. This is, I need to just shut this thing up. This is. <laughs> if you like books. <laughs> if you like books. Oh, okay. So here's the story behind this. So I have a soundboard and it's like the Phantom from uh, last week. Was Halloween last week? Halloween was last week. The Phantom's coming back and it is like messing with my tablet that i use for a soundboard and it is just not making me have a good time anyway let me get back to the implications of this emoji thing so mapping your face onto an avatar has some huge applications for like the virtual reality field right so if you think about uh expressing yourself in a virtual environment if they can do it with this technology and if you map that into a virtual environment then you can express emotion to other people in a shared virtual space, which is something that we don't really have right now. And this an emoji is like, I hate to, I, 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 I hate emoji. Let me just say it. I hate emoji. It's stupid. I don't understand it. Uh, it might just be me getting old, but I, I don't understand it. And, but this is the first time where I kind of looked at it and was like, okay, all right. I see, I see some sort of merit to this. That's funny that you don't like emojis. I mean, I felt the same way previously, but you know what actually made me change my mind was hopping in Slack and using some of the emojis to like, you know, when we, when you and I go back and forth, it's like signing off on stories with a thumbs 100%. up. 100%. And trying to do like short transactions or something like that. Um, yeah. But that's a really interesting use case of something like this with the, an emoji, it, like uh, applying it to the VR space. Yeah. Because it, it's totally doable. I mean... The only part that I would wonder about is how it like captures your the the spot that's I guess covered up by your actual VR headset, right? Yeah. I'm assuming you'd still have to have some sort of camera outside of VR that's like flashing at you, getting your facial features to then like propagate it to the actual emoji or avatar in this case in VR. Sure, but there's ways around that. I mean, there's in unit or in HMD uh, mounted eye tracking software um, that would probably do the trick. So. Uh, I'm just, I'm just interested in to see, you know, like I, I even asked on the Slack earlier this week, if anyone knows anyone that is doing, uh, research in VR, I'm getting too far down the VR train. And I know some listeners and there was like, I could talk about, I could, I wouldn't mind listening to a VR podcast, but this is not about VR. This is about human factors. What do you say we get into some human factors news? Let's go, man. All righty. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about sports. Just kidding. That's left over from last week. This is anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors. Blake, what have we got up first? All right. So back in 2015, Microsoft launched its HoloLens as a gaming-centric com consumer headset but so far very few folks have actually picked it up as picked up picked up as much as a minecraft craft block using the device which makes sense with its hefty price tag of about 3k and that's also because there was hololens success has majorly been with businesses allowing designers to actually visualize digital changes on real life objects and helping employees do complex tasks or high-tech product demos now the hololens has actually been certified for use as a basic protective eyewear with an IP50 rating for dust protection in construction zones. And Nick, I was stoked that you put this in the Slack this week because, I mean, I think it's a an interesting take of a, pro a product being launched with like this gaming-centric use, but then similar to kind of Google Glass, it finds itself in a completely different and new home, but it's still very successful. Yep, uh, yep, 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 yep. Uh, did you make it through that okay, man? <laughs> Good golly, I don't even a, know what that was. I should have practiced before I got on tonight. It's okay, a lot, of, a lot of tough work. Words, it's a Monday. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So this is interesting, right? Because the uh, the whole augmented reality being pervasive into the workspace is now one step closer, especially for jobs where you are you are required to 
engage in potentially more dangerous things where you have to have eye safety on. And this is one way to make eye safety cool. If you have a heads up display that helps you display information about your environment on your head, and it also doubles as protective eyewear. It's just one of those examples where sort of the, uh, the ergonomics behind something and the actual, um, what am I trying to say here? The, the, uh, the design of the applications kind of come together as one sort of unit and allow the user to be protected from multiple angles, right? From bad UX and from um, the physical environment. That's what I'm trying to say. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that makes complete sense, especially when some of the use cases called out in the actual article were people that are repelling or repairing. Man, I can't speak tonight. They were repairing like really big objects like elevators. So this is definitely like alluding back to what you said, very dangerous work. And so any kind of, you know, extra either information or protection that this particular device, the HoloLens can actually provide is great. And also you see this in apparently building cars as well, which makes a lot of sense on kind of that industrial floor where you're interacting with a lot of different robots. It's kind of high risk if it's a human in that situation. So it just makes a lot of sense to use. Yeah, now one thing I didn't see was, did they do anything different to make this uh, IP50 rating? Or was it just something that uh, it kind of fell into by default? You know, that's a good question. I don't know if the article actually dives into that, because a lot of what the article was really focused on was this has been so successful in the U.S. that countries outside of the U.S. really want this product in their in their factories and in their settings or in their design settings as well. So that was a lot of the focus. The IP50 rating, although it was really the title of the article, was just kind of like thrown in there as a tag unless you see otherwise. Yeah, so I'm looking here at the official blog post, and I don't think it says anything about sort of uh, any improvements that they uh, that they they actually did to it. So they, they mentioned that the HoloLens p- uh, passes basic impact tests for protective eyewear standards in North America and Europe. It's been tested and found to conform to the basic impact protection standards of ANSI, um, blah, 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 uh, and common protective glass certification standards. So I don't think it actually, I don't think they did anything else to it. I think... They just kind of put it through this certification process. Uh, or at least if they did do something to it, they did not mention it here on the official blog post. So, Yeah, if I was to take a stab at why it's not in the blog post is because I would I would assume that when they launched this back in 2015 as a gaming console or a gaming add-on, like a consumer headset for VR or AR, they probably made changes once they realized where it was actually being utilized. So maybe that's been done over a longer time ago than where we currently are, where it's now like being used in more industrial settings. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'd be, uh, be curious to see whether or not they did change that, but all right. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we move on to the next one? The only closing thought I really have is I thought it was interesting that in about like two years or I guess less than that, about a year, it looks like the next HoloLens that'll be released. will try and implement actual artificial, artificial intelligence chips which should expand its capabilities i thought especially based on the article we have a little later in the show that that was a really interesting idea from microsoft's point of view especially since a human will be wearing this i feel like you could really get a lot of maybe the predictive nature of ai learning systems to help people out throughout maybe spotting accidents before they happen or discovering new ways of potentially repairing items such as like elevators or in or in the instance of building cars so i look forward to seeing those kinds of stories and the improvements of hololens over time you know what you mentioned uh, a little bit down the line here that you have the artificial intelligence article or that we have uh why don't we just jump into it now that's a good segue Yep, let's get into it. (laughs) All right, so back to Microsoft. In 2016, Microsoft released a playful chatbot named Tay onto Twitter designed to show off the tech giant's artificial intelligence research. And lo and behold, within 24 hours, it had become one of the Internet's ugliest experiments. By learning from its interaction with interactions with other Twitter users, Tay quickly went from tweeting about how awesome humans are to claiming that Hitler was correct. So Tay demonstrated an important issue with machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
and that is that robots can be as racist, sexist, or prejudiced as humans if they acquire the knowledge from written acquire knowledge from text written by humans. Fortunately, though, loads of scientists, including those from Microsoft, may now have discovered a way to better understand the design, the decision making process of artificial intelligence algorithms to help permit prevent such biasing using a debugging tool called Deep Explore. Okay, so let's deconstruct this. So we all know that artificial intelligence is as good as we make it, and this is basically saying that this Deep Explore is going to sort of counter-correct, uh, or, or I guess not counter-correct, it's like it's going to help us make artificial intelligence that's more neutral especially when it comes to um, exerting pre-baked prejudice that the programmers or whoever is is, uh, sort of developing these algorithms inherently, uh, not actively, but inherently program into their systems, right? Yeah, it basically comes down to the fact that I think when all these AI systems and machine learning algorithms were being designed, they're originally just trying to get the algorithm to work without a lot of too much thought being thought about, okay, the problem here is a lot of data that we feed these algorithms is going to change what they learn, and there's such a large amount of it that we won't always be able to control. What do we do for that? And I think this, like, debugging tool is probably the best way they can go about it, where basically, let's say, and it's applied both in kind of like a textual chatbot sense, and they talk a little bit about kind of applied in automation of driving cars, but the basic idea is it, it does work like a debugging tool so it flags an instance of pro- that's problematic and kind of teaches the ai back or teaches and flags in the actual machine learning algorithm like hey we should restrain this kind of behavior this kind of response uh, based on the inputs that we got so it's it's kind of adding that second layer of logic of okay i'm taking in all this information and building rules in my right. neural network well here's how i can kind of weed it out right so this is so yeah, this is kind of correcting for what inputs it's getting and, and not so much the algorithms that we program into it. 100%. And it's I I couldn't believe the like broad application of this cuz thinking of it and as the with the example of the chatbot, of course it makes sense. I mean, you're going to have to figure out a way for it to filter down the information that it's getting from so many different people. Um, and then I, I know Tay is not the only experiment that's kind of gone wrong like this, turning into uh, whether it's like racist or sexist or prejudiced comments coming out of it after it's been released. Yeah. Didn't we just but, talk about another one a couple of weeks ago or did I just see that and not post it? No, we've definitely talked about one before and it wasn't from Microsoft. It was from somebody else. Uh, but I cannot remember the name of it. Yeah. So but the, go ahead. So the interesting part to me was that this also applies to self-driving cars. So this kind of debugging process has such utility across all sorts of AI systems. So what what's going on in self-driving cars here? So this is, I'll do my best to kind of give a, the briefest explanation, right? But basically researchers and developers went into, or tested AI algorithms by actually trying to trick the AI and self-driving cars into making mistakes. So based on visual presentations that get it would give it, so in this case, maybe a turn on a road, it would try and trick the sensors of the AI to make the wrong decision. So let's say we're going around like a left turn, um, and by changing the images, usually making them darker, to trick the AI, what they would do is trick the sensors that would force that AI bot to make the wrong decision. So let's say like driving through a guardrail instead of turning correctly left. So this this is kind of really where it's going back and going back into the neural network and making sure that the tool understands like, okay, based off of this imagery that you got, this is the, this is the mistake that you made and here's how we can try and fix it and keep it logged in the system. Man, all this AI stuff is like way over my head and I, I wish I knew more about it because... Like I, uh, I asked in the Slack earlier this week, like I mentioned, if anyone does research with artificial intelligent um, or AI generated assets in in virtual worlds. So like this, this is kind of along those lines, right? And this this article actually kind of got me thinking about this. Um, and the reason why I posed the question, right? Because if it's able to sort of understand that things are mistakes 
uh, and, and sort of correct from that, then that has a lot of implications for getting artificial intelligence to arrive at the correct conclusion. So there's a lot of implications for this. And, and I mean, we, we, uh, you know, we, we joke about it sometimes that the singularity is coming and that it's going to take us over. But, um, you know, it's cases like this where I, I look at it and I'm, I'm just impressed with the, the advance, the speed of advance that we are making in the field of artificial intelligence. And I feel honestly like I'm getting a little left behind um, because it's going to be such a unique challenge for us human factors practitioners to design systems in which we are interacting with artificial intelligent agents. And, uh, you know, this is just, it, it feels like it, the developers are just kind of going and going and going and, and uh, you know, we have no chance to catch up and, and to develop these systems for humans. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a far-reaching problem for anybody that does design work or in human factors. I mean, you have to try your best, especially if you're a company that's not working on these kind of AI systems or even thinking in the long haul that you might integrate them into whether it's like your design systems or real-world applications like self-driving cars. I mean, we've got to find ways to make sure we stay up with the technology because even though it's it seems like it's, uh, you know, more infinite this stage that stuff grows so exponentially and i mean we there's even it even calls out a specific test in this article where they tested around like 15 state-of-the-art neural networks for machine learning for self-driving cars developed by nvidia and then they found thousands of bugs within a very short amount of time but this algorithm was able to also you know spot these errors correct them and store them in the database so this this advancement in self-driving cars is really going to change a lot of the climate for jobs and design as well so I, I i don't know i really think it's 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 hard to find ways to really stay on top of the ai space especially since i'm definitely not very well versed in it yeah so just to go over those implications or applications, right? So you got you got the uh, <clears throat> tra air traffic control systems that could potentially be applied to, or AI be applied to those, as well as uh, malware. And let's see what else we got here. Um, so there there could be the potential of eliminating racism and uh, discriminatory assumptions, sort of. Within predictive policing, I mean, we talked about this with the Ronald Davis talk a couple weeks ago, right? And, uh, you know, in a, in a case like policing reform, we could see something like that. And we even talked about robocops on the show. So, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's the potential to integrate it into those systems and potentially have a more just system that doesn't operate on racism and prejudice. Yeah. So, okay, Nick, this brings a really like interesting spin to this. And I had this kind of existential conversation with my girlfriend over the weekend about this article. Um, and I, as much good as I definitely think will come out of this, I think it does get scary in a few points uh, from the hacking aspect or from who's making the, the decisions from high up when they design these algorithms. What is, you know, in this case, good or bad? Right. Or what are the, what are these decision making um, especially decision making choices about decisions that AI will make, uh, and I feel like that that'll lead into strange legal loopholes and also cybersecurity problems of changing how AI interprets a situation. Uh, and again, this is super that's super down a dark hole that's decades away, but it's it's definitely something to think about the advancement of security over the next you know few decades and how it aligns with AI, especially if we're talking about integrating AI in you know bigger systems like in the government. Um, yeah so just for, food for thought for sure. I, I love that you and Elise had a existential conversation. <laughs> about this stuff over the weekend <laughs> I, oh, uh, I got so pumped on this article <laughs> <laughs> anyway you know what another application of this could be you just mentioned you it got? with the with the whole uh, augmented reality hololens vr boom segue all right what's the next story nice all right so vr is obviously advancing in leaps and bounds but some interactions still remain pretty problematic in the virtual world and one such problem that people have to deal with is using a keyboard so even if you've been touch typing for decades, just figuring out where your keys are can be hard once you've dropped into another virtual world. But Logitech is looking to seek 
solve this problem as the keyboard maker extraordinaire is tackling the problem with a small product test of VR keyboards for the HTC Vive that actually overlays a view of your hands into the VR space to help you find the trusty home row keys. So, I, Nick, I'm going to have to rely a little bit on your expertise with VR here. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, where should I start? But what... what ha- I'm kind of confused on why this is so problematic. Because let's say, okay, I was typing something in a virtual world, right? Yes. Would I not be like see an actual keyboard? No. So here's how it how, here's how it operates now, Blake. Let me let me put it down for you. So you have this device on your head. It masks your entire reality. It masks well, sure. at least it masks your entire vision, right? So in order to let's say you want to switch modes and you want to go to a different game or a different experience in this virtual environment, the thing you have to do is kind of tilt the device on your head up so you can look down and kind of type out of the corner of your eye while you're looking down and feel for the keyboard. And especially if you're playing a game where you're using keyboard controls like WASD or if you're using uh, WASD, if you're using uh, like a like a special commands for a virtual experience, right? So, or even a program that you are manipulating a uh, a device, right? It always works better when you can actually see the device that you're manipulating. And so right now, as it stands, you're peeking out the bottom of your eyes, looking at the keyboard. But with this, you can literally just look down and the device on the, uh, the Vive is going to recognize the Logitech keyboard and it will map your hands against it and project them into the virtual environment. So you can see what your hands are doing um, and it's a way to switch modes without the whole clunkiness of removing the VR headset or adjusting it so you can see down below. Well, then this sounds like an awesome add-on because now that I think about it, my question was a little bit crass because, of course, you're sitting like looking forward, right? You're, if you are like in a virtual reality experience, you're probably even if you did look down right now, it probably wouldn't show anything that's outside of the virtual world. Right. So this makes a whole lot more sense than if it's a keyboard that helps you or that is helping work with sensors that are actually on your VR headset to know that, okay, now I'm looking at my looking down towards my keyboard here, are my hands on the keys. And for sure, I totally get that. It's a lot easier to type or do whatever you need to do. If you can see yourself actually doing it. Yeah. I think we got some audio here from the actual, uh, article here. I'm pulling it up. Music. Many people are expressing some desire to have an effective typing experience in VR, and that's what Logitech has tried to address. We're talking about the Bridge SDK, which we're releasing to developers. It works in conjunction with the HTC Vive Tracker, which attaches to a Logitech gaming keyboard. When you link the HTC Vive Tracker to the keyboard with the software, it gives you a 3D model of the keyboard in your virtual environment. This works across all applications that use Steam VR as their building block. You can see your hands and how they interact with the keyboard. There's lots of on-screen options. We've done a number of different skins. You can make the border disappear. You can turn the keyboard into a contextual companion for you. Yeah, so that pretty much says it all. I mean, I know, I know, Blake, you couldn't hear the audio, but he was basically going over everything that we just kind of pointed out. Um, the only other notable exceptions were that they you can add themes to it, and there's a bunch of on-screen commands in the virtual environment that you can then manipulate as well. Well, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I, I I'm really excited about this. Uh, obviously, for someone like me who uh, spends a lot of time in the virtual world. Um, I mean, the, the example that they have on the video and on, on the article here is that they are typing and, and navigating YouTube in a virtual environment. And it very well may be that you are in a game and need to look up a tutorial on how to do something and then you sh- shift modes and go to YouTube. But instead of taking off the headset and going to your desktop monitor, you are just doing it in in the space itself and you, you don't have to switch modes. And that's like one of the biggest problems. The next step... Uh, and I've seen a couple prototypes of this is going to be mapping it to your phone to where you can check your phone, your time, all your apps that work on your phone are then projected into the virtual environment. So that way you don't have to uh, sort of pull out and um, interact with the physical environment. Wow. That, that's just going to be such a crazy and different 
like I don't know gaming or life experience when you're if especially if they once they get headsets down to something that's like not as heavy set on your face because I can just imagine flowing in between my phone playing a game watching YouTube working on I don't know a Google Doc with you or something like that I just think there's a lot of crazy potential here for sure uh, the one thing that I thought was awesome about this article though is that they're releasing it to the um, they're releasing it to to the public to let developers, you know, tinker with it, mess with the SDK, see what's going on. I just I think that's an awesome step to really try and grow this from the community. I completely agree. Yeah, things always work out better. I think when you send it out and open source it, uh, and that way, a lot of people get their hands on it, and a lot of ideas are coming through. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before I uh, thank our friends? No, let's thank our friends. All right, thank you to all of our friends over at. TechCrunch and Gadget, Yahoo News, and IEEE Spectrum for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can join us on our Slack. We post all of our articles there, and you can follow us on social media for links to the original articles as we find them. Our Slack our Slack people, they get the articles first, and then we post them to social media. See see what happens here? We we favor the people in our Slack. I'm trying to get you guys to sign up for Slack. Do it. Go. Do it. Just do it. <laughs> Hang on. Where's, where's Shia? Do it. There he is. There he is. Just, Just do it. All right, go to Slack. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? So much soundboard tonight. <laughs> all trying. right, so up next, we've got a commercial truck driving. So, all right, let's back that up. So commercial truck driving is definitely an exhausting job. There are que- requires <laughs> constant attention to the road. And drivers falling asleep during long stretches is a major concern to their safety and others around them. So Ford and San Paulo-based creative agency GTB partnered to develop the safe cap, a hat that senses head movements associated with sleepiness and wakes the driver with sound light and vibration. You know, I reading this article, I thought it was a really cool pick, but I was so surprised that something like this didn't already exist in this space. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was actually kind of surprised too. It seems like a, an opportunity ripe for, um, sort of products right to, to help with this problem yeah i mean it's i don't know a lot of this confused me too because it, we're we're working in a space now and i know it's not like tomorrow that this is going to happen but a lot of autonomous vehicles are going to take over some of the pains of these kind of these kind of things so ford working on a headset like this it it just seems a little later in the game for this to be done uh, but it seems from the research that they did of mapping these different head motions to really differentiate how what happens when people are driving. Are they are they actually falling asleep or are they just doing something different? I mean, they did a lot of upfront leg work that probably came out with a great product. And I think this was only released in Brazil for the time being, but s- soon it'll be released in other countries. Yeah, I actually have audio, but it's in uh it's in Spanish, so we're not going to play that. But, but it's it's interesting to see sort of yeah the different motions of the head, right? Where they actually, I believe they actually did a research with um, sort of having a camera on the human operator and mapping these motions of when they were falling asleep versus when they were actually performing an, uh, a a monitoring task, um, and. Really, the the headset itself is pretty simple. It's got just an accelerometer on it that will um, send a signal to sort of this flashing light on the bill of the cap that that uh, sort of alerts the driver, like, wake up, you're, you're falling asleep. Uh, it's really interesting to watch. If you have time to go watch this video, um, these, uh, these drivers, like one of them's yawning. And uh, as he's yawning, the, the cap will detect that his head is moving back. And so the lights will flash in his face. And it's very simplistic. It's very simplistic, but it's something that's um, actually quite effective. And honestly, yes, autonomous vehicles are coming. But in something like a, like a country that may not be as fortunate as us to have autonomous vehicles in this, this type of um, th- this technology, right? This is something very affordable that they can put on their entire force and may cause a reduction in um, driver related incidents. Yeah. I, I would definitely love to see how it grows over time, especially in terms of impact. Cause I mean, it, it is rather simple and hopefully it does, 
you know, reduce any kind of driver related accidents for this kind of stuff. Cause I know that a lot of times truck drivers are driving long evenings and this <laughs> hopefully vibrating sound and lights is enough to wake them up. Uh, I, the only thing I would be concerned about is kind of, is it, is all of this, uh, you know, notification to a driver, like really jolting, would it make you make sudden movements? But obviously again, they've researched, it sounds like they've researched what happens when, okay, they're making these head move- movements or sleep. Let's see how we can wake them up as easily as possible. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and just, to me, this kind of seems like one of those student projects that actually has a lot of wide ranging implications. Like I hate to, I hate to, to, it's not a, it's, it's not, I'm not classifying it as a student project. I want to be careful with my words here. I'm not classifying it as a student project, but it seems like something that could have came out of a student project, um, at least at, at, you know, the prototype level. And, uh, something like this could be, uh, something that a lot of people could use. And that's all I'm saying is that even the most simple of ideas can be something that benefits us for something <laughs> so eloquently <laughs> spoken it's a monday folks <laughs> no but i totally agree with you i mean regardless of how this idea came to be it it's uh no easy feat to get forward to back a prototype that you have or an idea sure so kudos to the to getting this out there and in the world and then doing the research up front to really hone in what what it needs because i can't imagine that it's very simple to know like okay based on these head movements this guy might be asleep or I can imagine the the shock to awareness if you're if it's getting it wrong. Oh sure, if it's sure. Like shooting lights out and making noise that could be very distracting to a driver. So obviously they they've done the hard work here for sure. Yeah. All right. Why don't we get into our last story of the week? Oh yes, this one. This is probably my favorite one because it just it sounds insane. But no existential talks about this one. Yeah, no existential talks about this one. It's rather straightforward. You well, know, we can have one right now. In your eye. <laughs> let's do it right now. All right, let's get it. So last week, French regulators approved the trial of the bionic vision implant that will be placed in people with advanced type, advanced type of retinal disease called dry age-related macular degeneration, or AMD for short. Thank goodness. So the chip acts as a conduit for communication between the eye and the brain using electrical stimulation, and the trial represents the first time such a chip has been used to treat this specific ailment to the retina called AMD and the leading co- and this is actually the leading cause of vision loss in people over 50. So I cannot even imagine two things. What it would be like to know that there's a chip in your eye that's, you know, basically sending electrical signals to communicate with your brain, but what it would be like at the at the age of 50 or even the age I am now because I wear glasses to have my vision improved by something like this. I know, yeah. So let me let me talk to you about ethics. Let's start this existential talk off right what about ethics okay tell me a little more about your ethical (laughs) questions here okay so will society accept this um they accept they they accept uh glasses right we both wear glasses we're accepted will i don't know i i feel like there could be some sort of pushback because it's a chip in your eye so is, are you talking about pushback from like social constructs, like people being like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want like a chip in my eye or I want a chip in my brain or any of that kind of stuff. Or are you talking more about like if people knew that you had that chip in your eye, like you people know that you have glasses, the ethical implications of that? I don't know, Blake. I'm just trying to start a existential conversation with you. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I, so um, actually, I have a weird question for you. I don't know how existential it is, but Nick, do you think this is a bionic or a correct use of calling it bionic vision? Because this is, to me, just electrical stimulation. Yeah, it seems that way. I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't, yeah, it seems like electrical stimulation for me, right? So so it, 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 you, you basically, they install this on the retina, and it stimulates what the eye would have seen, uh, or, or basically the light signals coming in and translates that to electrical signals, right? Yeah, that's that's pretty much the the long and short of it, which don't get me wrong. This is by no means like not a pretty big feat to conquer. I mean, you're putting a chip in the eye and it's communicating with the brain. But at the end of the day, it's just electrical signals back and forth, kind of stimulating um, neurons more and making sure I'm assuming parts of the eye fire correctly. Yeah, I yep. I I think 
I think it's going to be great. I'm 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 just trying to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, okay. So let's be a little a little existential for like just a second here. Okay, I thought of one. I'm good. All right. So here's a strange question. Like, where does this kind of I think this is definitely the first of many bionic rabbit holes we're going to see. And this is, this is definitely infant stage when we're talking like bionic. Cause I'm thinking like growing stuff in a vat. Yeah. Um, but where does it end? Because I mean, are, do we just keep replacing parts so people can live forever or what, what's to be said about how we age? Are we supposed to experience the world in a different way? Does it make us think about things differently? If we can't see as well, do we, do we attenuate to things more uh, vividly through sound instead of sight? You know, and I, by changing these kind of human features, are we manipulating, I don't know, the cosmos itself? I bet you there's a researcher out there dealing with this exact thing. And I would love to talk to them about this type of thing because I think about that all the time, right? Like, I, I don't know about you, Blake. I want to live forever. Yeah, that's a weird one, man. <laughs> Because uh, sometimes I think I do, but like uh, at the same time, thinking about the impacts of people living forever, I feel like that has a really big environmental and just social okay. Okay, put, construct put, con put, conversation to be had. Put that aside. Imagine we imagine you and your life as you know it stays relatively static. You still interact with the same people that you interact with because they can live forever too. The only thing that changes is the technology and put aside the whole overpopulation, put aside the, the environmental issues. Would you want to live forever? As long as the world kept advancing so I could continue learning. Yes. Because my fear would be becoming stagnant at some point. And in that case, no, I wouldn't want to live forever. Well, let me ask you though, does the fear of death get you to be more motivated because you have to accomplish something before you die? And would the, sort of onset of being able to live forever be uh, sort of like, well, I can just do it tomorrow because I'm going to live forever. Would it, yes. would it stagnate? See, I, I would worry about that kind of stagnation because I mean, I don't know, with different creative things I want to do, I always remind myself that like, hey, you uh, you only get to do this once. You might as well, you know, get out there and get to doing what you want to do. So that's like an, always an important driving factor for me thinking about that, you know, time is not time is not like given to you for any certain length of time. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's definitely a driving factor. And I wonder just because I know myself, I don't know about you or anybody else listening, but I know motivators are really important for me. And if I knew I was going to live forever, I might just, uh, hang out, not do a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you couldn't die, what would you be motivated to do? You know, I wasn't expecting to go down this rabbit hole with you tonight, but, uh, especially on our last story. Cause <laughs> But uh, I do have to say, if any of our listeners do study aging and kind of have a have their two cents about what would happen if technology got so advanced to the part to the point where we could eventually just replace our body parts, except for our brains, and and live forever, um, I gotta okay okay. Before we end with the existential stuff, man, I have to ask you a question. What's up, Nick? Because I've been I've been thinking a lot about this. I don't know why. But there's this, okay, so the concept of teleportation, right? You zap all your atoms and digitally reconstruct them somewhere else. How do you feel about this? Um, yeah, this is a conversation I've definitely had before. I, I don't really know how I feel about it. I wonder, so, okay, I love sci-fi, so this is going to sound reminiscent to a specific sci-fi show if anybody has seen it. But it makes me think of there's, there's definitely... Um, like anything, unexpected consequences. And by you reconfiguring your atoms every so often whenever you teleport, I feel like you're not going to be able to keep everything. And it's going to slowly degrade over time. Which, I mean, again, more technology to create to make sure that you have all the correct atoms you're supposed to have and your DNA works, all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know. I'm kind of scared of it, to be honest. Because think about it. You're splitting yourself into the most atomic item that you can be and then you're reconstructing it like how many times are they going to get that wrong <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. so my thought is you are effectively dead you are killing yourself when you teleport and then you are reconstructing a copy of you on the other end that's no longer you that's a copy of you and sure your copy will have all the consciousness that 
was involved before you went in, but that's not you. That's a copy of you. I, I don't know why I've been thinking about it, and this is way down the rabbit hole. I think we should get on the show. Oh, uh, yeah, let's get on, because I could go on for days about this kind oh, of stuff. Oh, I, I could too, and I'm actually kind of glad I brought it up, but uh, who knows? Maybe maybe we'll do an existential podcast. We'll see what our listeners think. All right, uh, so, Blake, I think we uh, are going to do a new segment of the show. What do you think? A new segment? A new segment. This is What a- is this? This is a new segment uh, of the show that we like to simply call, we ask you guys questions, you answer them in our Slack, then we read them on the show. This is the part of the show where we turn to you guys in our Slack community to get a sense of uh, what you guys are up to. We ask you a question and you answer it. It's that simple. So so this week we ask, what's the number one thing you're thinking about as a human factors slash UX, et cetera, practitioner? So we got a couple answers here. Blake, you want to go over ours first, and then uh, and then kind of see what other people are thinking. Man, I feel like that we should go over the listeners first, just because they they hear from our perspectives all the time, and I That's think true. some of these questions or answers we got are great. That's fair. Okay, so uh, so UX Andreas, we've heard from him a couple times on the show. As someone who's been studying UX for over a bit now, a bit over a year now, I spend a lot of time thinking about the psychology of people, why we do the things we do, how we spend hours clicking away without thinking, why I procrastinate when I know it would be better off to get things done now, how we manage our spaces and spaces and so on. Uh, so Blake, let's let's break this down a little bit. I want to talk about this one because this is the whole reason why I got into psychology in the first place. I um. I actually watched someone do something that I won't repeat on the show, uh, but I, I watched someone do something and I said, what happened in your head that made you arrive at that conclusion to do that act? And once I was introduced to the field of psychology and started understanding why people did the things they did, the act became a lot clearer to me. And so it's 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 interesting to see that 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 very thing is what's keeping UX Andrea still going. And that's awesome to me. That is awesome. And I think it's always, it's a constant kind of struggle with myself for sure about like, he misses procrastination and then understanding what, what systems you need to put in place to hack your own psychology, right? To keep you motivated or to keep you pushing forward on your own. But it's, it's also another interesting point that he puts in here it's how we can kind of spend our time doing to to us seems kind of pointless things without really thinking about it, like scrolling up a bunch on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter or whatever your, you know, social media drug of choice is, but also how we harvest that kind of understanding of what brings people to technology and how we keep them there and how we provide them experiences. Like the whole, the whole thing is about really understanding what's going on in the human mind as insofar as that we can understand it. And then what we can do to build things around that. I I think that really, I don't know, if we look at our entire world, that's kind of how it comes about, right? So yeah, I understand how people think, and that's that gives you the world we're in. Yeah, psychologists are in a really interesting situation where we understand human psyche, and we are often, you know, we, we know what's going on, but a lot of times we're powerless to stop what's going on even within ourselves. <laughs> You know, it's it's like you said, hacking our own psychology. Anyway, I thought this was a great entry. Uh, so thank you, UX Andreas, for writing in. We also got one from Brian McD. This one is, uh, I mostly do physical 3D design right now, and I'm always interested in how that's going to do, how that's going to go digital in the future and playing with my o- Oculus Rift. Uh, so obviously, uh, Brian McD knows how to put the brownie points on me. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely high five for having a Oculus Rift of your own. That's awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm curious to see what he uh, what he's playing around with, and I should definitely follow up in the Slack with that. But uh, but I I gotta ask you, Blake, what do you go? What do you got going on right now? Because we we answered this question too. Because we like to share a little bit about ourselves as well. Because it's not it's not fun when it's a one way street. Um, let's make these short and sweet though. Most definitely. All right. So I was at a webinar earlier last week. And it was from two designers at IBM, and one happened to be a visual designer that works on a development team with blockchain. And ever since you and I really broke down that article of the implications of using blockchain technology for, you know, commerce uh, across countries, uh, using ships and just using, understanding the the decision-making implications of 
transversing across borders, languages, data, and figuring out how to present that information in a way that's useful, visual, visually usable, and actually helps people make at-a-glance decisions. So blockchain's been really big on my mind as far as the implications for human factors people, for designers, for developers. It's I'm always thinking about it and reading about it. What about you, Nick? What do you got going on? Well, I said it before. I'll say it again. I'm uh, really into the uses of practical or practical uses of virtual reality and augmented reality. I'm, I want to know how can we use it as a tool to optimize or enhance our human performance, right? Uh, and I talked even earlier about the artificial intelligence and, and being able to uh, use AI to create virtual environments for training and simulation and whatnot. But uh, that's that's our two cents. Uh, let us know what you think of our new segment, uh, the, the part of the show where we ask you guys questions, you answer them in our Slack, and we read them on the show. That's the segment. That's the se- that we're sticking with it. That's the segment title. <laughs> it's such a wonderfully succinct title. I, I think don't so. think you could do. We couldn't do any better. I think so. Yeah. I mean, let's but let's switch gears. Let's get to the it came from Reddit because we still got that. We still got our community outreach. This is part of the show where we search all over Reddit, bring you guys topics uh, that the community is talking about. So any subreddits fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst us, the community. So up today we got EXO. Uh, this is on the user experience subreddit, and they write uh, that the subject is uh, career path strategy for recovering from taking a bad UX job. Uh oh. So after a year and a half at my current position, I've given up hope that it's ever going to get better. Uh, let's see here. Backstory. I and another UX designer of the same level, MFA, about three years of UX experience, were hired uh, with lots to talk about building up some level of research within a company that's almost 20 years of business had never actually talked to a user. We later found out that the company had a terrible track record with UX people, mostly because they were underutilized, uh, not allowed to do research, and generally expected to be product managers. This all dovetails with a change in regime for the product management department in general. While it uh, seems to be the first remotely effective product team the company has had, uh, the head of it, who is my boss, doesn't really understand what UX is despite multiple inspired explanations. We are now hiring consultants for UX work, period, question mark. Uh, This is a long one, but uh, we're almost done. (laughs) I say this long, one, so it doesn't look bad on my resume, and two, because the pay is above average, but I think it's time to go. However, my confidence is in the gutter. I have very little to show for my time here, and I am also totally sick of UX. What? Uh, I think I'm just jaded from bad experience. At the same time, I looked at LinkedIn and see designers who were junior and under me at previous jobs taking senior and director positions. Anyway, I just wanted to vent a little and see if anyone else has gone through this slash gotten this and had any thoughts. Blake, you picked this one this week. Does this one uh, re- does this one resonate with you for some reason? Oh or- yeah, <laughs> it definitely does. I've got like a lot of opinion stuff on it. So, but okay, I will try and not be as verbose as I tend to be. Uh, it's okay, man. We're a podcast. You can be as verbose as you want. Our currency, okay. our currency so- is talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, XO. So I'm going to level with you on a couple of different places, and I really encourage you to listen to me all the way through. Lay it down. Part of the problem here is it sounds like you've, you maybe, okay, you said you've got three years of experience, and I'm kind of surprised if you're in a UX position, and if you have that kind of experience that you haven't gone through this problem before, where you're hopping in a company, especially during this time, where UX is just a hot commodity, and... People don't know what they're hiring for, but they are hiring for it. So you get in there and you have to work as hard as you can showing people what you do, what you're supposed to be doing. And sometimes you have to go a little outside of the box and get a, get a little bit gorilla to show people the value. And this, uh, this, this comment you've got here about being underutilized or not allowed to do research or expected to be a product manager, that's typical in a lot of different user experience, or in my case too, human factors researcher jobs, where you get thrown in, people expect you to do things, but they don't necessarily know what you're supposed to be doing. And you really have to harness your ability to talk to upper management and know how they understand ROI, like what what's meaningful to your C-suite teams, what's meaningful to the people that are in product management positions, and so on. And you know, I've been in this I've been in this position before, 
where I got in a job. I was really excited because they wanted human factors people, but they didn't know what to do with it. And it sounds like here that I, a similar experience I had, you have to really be ready for a grind. And sometimes it's really hard to want to do, and there doesn't really even seem like there's payoff for it. But this is part of being somebody in UX. You have to, you know, evangelize the topic, work outside of your means at some times because it says you couldn't do research. Well, what data did you have? Could you do anything with it? Uh, so it also sounds like you have some kind of product head that could be very useful to you. If they, even if they don't really understand what UX is, if they're the best leader you have, you just got to keep cracking at them. And I totally understand the, uh, the problem with having consultants being hired to do the work that you would normally do. The thing here is it's likely what you're going to see is they'll try and do the same things and people and your company will fight against it. But I don't know. Honestly, if, if you're still at this company, I would talk to these consultants they bring in, see how they would evangelize UX, because likely you'll find out that they want to help you. Um, lastly, uh, just don't get discouraged. I, sometimes jobs just suck. Like, I, I don't know the ins and outs of this job, but sometimes you just get there and it's just not what you expected. And it sounds like you did the right thing. You stayed for your resume and your pay is good. So that's a good thing. Don't don't be underconfident. And as far as being worried about not having stuff to show for it, figure it out, figure out some kind of portfolio <laughs> piece out. you can put together or some way to talk about the job that spins it positively for you. There, there's no way that this entire experience you've had has been all negative. There's got to be at least some, some little nugget of UX you either got in or you convinced somebody that, Hey, this is really important, anything like that. So, uh, and I said that was the last thing apologize it's not one more don't start comparing yourself to other people and worrying about that somebody junior to you that when you guys are the same level got a better job than you did that's never going to stop you got to be satisfied with what you're doing with your own life do what makes you happy <laughs> exactly <laughs> i don't want to end the show on that but i do want to i i, I want to well, do what makes you happy right and and then that's a that's a good way to end the show shit i don't i don't know <laughs> I want to speak more to this, but that was such a good... Okay, I will say a couple things here. So, yes, uh, things don't always go the way as planned at a new job, like Blake said. Uh, and I I pretty much just want to echo what Blake said. Like, find your own way. Uh, try to spin it the way you best you can. And, uh, yeah, jobs suck. And I've been in the situation where you've had to evangelize the importance of human factors, and they didn't really understand what you're... Uh, what your role was. And um, so it sounds like you're thinking of leaving unless did, did he leave already? I, I didn't catch that. Uh, I read it. No, it looks like that's what they're going to do. And right from the question, it's like recovering from a bad UX job. I don't know. I think they're in a good spot to be honest. I think so too. And I think, I, I don't know. I would see this more of a challenge, right? In the situation that I was in, I kind of, viewed it as like well what can i do i had to work within constraints and i like working within constraints it might not be you might be a person that that requires a lot of resources to get your job done and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just another way of doing things but i like being constrained and trying to find a unique way to uh, tackle a challenge and uh if you can do that in the job then uh you can that's a lot to put on your resume or portfolio that you can say, like, look, here are all the challenges I faced, and I came out on top, and we figured this out. So, I don't know. Do what makes you happy, right? <laughs> 100%. Nick, you make a really good point, too. Understanding the constraints of the job and what you can do and what you did working in them is a great way to spin whatever you put on your resume or in your portfolio. And honestly, that's good to take to your next job, too. Like, understand what really didn't work and maybe – how you can improve the next organization you go to or improve upon yourself, like how you can, you know, learn to communicate with different stakeholders differently. Um, there's just, there's a lot that you've learned. I still think you're in a good spot and I can't wait to see another job in UX for you. Yes, or maybe the same job and he's doing better. But uh, that's going to wrap it up for today. Let us know what you guys think of our stories this week. Did you like them, hate them? Let us know. Uh, let us know what you think of our new segment too. We ask you questions, you answer them on Slack, and we answer them on the show. Uh, if you have any questions for topics, or suggestions, I guess, or news stories that you want us to cover, you can head on over to our social media. We're on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our Slack, like I said. Our link can be found in the show notes, website, 
wherever we are at. Uh, those can, uh, on our SoundCloud as well, you can leave us a comment over there or uh, send us an email over at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, want to support us financially, uh, you can support us over at uh, patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you like what we're doing and want to support us not financially, that's okay too. We just ask that you subscribe and, you know, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts with an emoji if you can. Can you do that? I don't know. Blake, you should try that. <laughs> We're about to find out. All right. Or you can go to the Google Play Store or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. B.A., Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners go to find you if they want to hang out with you and, uh, you know, ask you for some advice with their career? Oh, my goodness. You guys can always find me in the Human Factors Cast Slack. Please join if you haven't already. But if you're looking for me somewhere else on social media, you can always get me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on the Slack and pretty much on the Slack because I don't post on Twitter. But if you want to follow me there or on LinkedIn, I'm at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, join the Slack. It depends. It depends on if you're the Slack or not. Join the Slack. Do it. Just join the Slack. Do it. Join the Slack and join the Slack. We'll get you a discount on bionic eyeballs. Video game music. We're joining the Slack. <laughs>